Hello, BookTube. This is Alan here for a Monday Friday Reads video. Well, you could call it Monday Reads because I missed uh, Friday Reads. And the reason I missed a Friday Reads video is because I was writing a story. And, and when I write a story, the, the story takes resonance over everything. And I cannot concentrate on something else. Uh, when I'm walking, when I'm riding the bus, when I'm at work, when I'm at the gym. Uh, sometimes I'm <laughs> trying to go to bed. I get, get frustrated because I still have the story in my head. And I'm thinking of the next paragraph, the next sentence, and sometimes even the next word. And yeah, this is the story you can see there. I write really small. I get about 400 words on the page. Yeah, I was uh, writing a story. And for those of you who are interested in what the story is about, it is about a Korean crime family where a single uh, dad is trying to raise a uh, a teenage girl turning his teenage daughter and he's trying to keep his teenage daughter away from his uh, business with, with uh, the dealing with crimes and drugs and embezzlement and everything else that goes along with it but his daughter is persistent and uh, sneaks around what his dad says and gets involved also so it's a, it's a strong female character type story. I don't know how it's going to go. Uh, so I finished The Lost Pianos of Siberia by Sophie Roberts. This is her debut novel. It is already out in stories. Uh, I think it came out on the 15th. It came out sometime this month. And this was incredible. This was a great book. Of course, Siberia contains 11% of the world's landmass. It's us. And so she just takes this journey searching for these pianos that were there since 18, excuse me, 1880s. And there's some great pictures on um, Instagram of uh, Kodak. I took some excellent pictures along along with this book and shows you some excellent pictures of Siberia and parts and areas that she goes into which I gave more detail on my last Friday reads about a hundred years ago so it's, inc it's an incredible it's an incredible book it's called uh, The Lost Piano of Siberia the next read I finished uh, Dr. Survago by Boris Pasternak and this uh, film covered uh, film cover of the book and it's kind of beaten up but I'm going to keep it because in the back it has the poems of Yure Survago. <clears throat> so let me read you one. This is really short. Hamlet. <clears throat> the stir is over. I step forth on the boards, lean against an upright arm at the entrance. I str strain to make the far off echo yield, a cue to the events that may come in my day. Night in its murk transfix and pin me. Staring through thousand binoculars, if thou be willing, Abba Father, remove this cup from me. I cherish this, thy righteous, uh, thy rigor, rigorous conception, and I can consent to play this part therein. But another play is running at this moment. So far, the present released me from the cast, and yet the order of the acts have been schemed and plotted, and nothing can avert the final curtain's fall. I stand alone. 
Oasis form by Parasism. To live life to the end is not a childish task. I enjoy this book. At this novel is character driven, but not character centered. It uh, focuses on a bloody Valentine, the Russian Revolution, and you have uh, helpless, frustrated. People who are trampled under a relentless, uh, rolling forward bulldozer of history. And they are just stuck in it. And so a lot of people say, would say, well, that's uh, exactly what's going on in America right now. No, that's not going on with America that, right now. That has been going on since the 1960s. And actually it had its roots in the 1950s. So that's Dr. Zervago by Boris Pasternak. On my phone, I read, um, on my phone, I read uh, A Cozy Mystery by Ashley Weaver. Some of you might, who read mysteries might know the name. Ashley Re Weaver is the author of six books and called the Amory Ames novels, mysteries, detective stories, and she is, uh, so you have the main character, Amory Ames, and this is the seventh book, it's called The Deception of Thorncrest, and it comes out in September, in the bookstores, or ebooks, and I'm almost through with it, I got about 50 pages to go, and the, uh, this one, she is pregnant in this story, and her husband, Milo, is in the story, and then a, a woman appears at their manor house at Thorncrest in England. These, this is set during the 1930s in England, for those who don't follow uh, Ashley Weaver's novels. Set during the uh, 1930s in England, Thorncrest, she's, uh, this is like an estate. And a woman shows up, claiming to be uh, Milo, uh, Amory Ames, is, they were married, and uh, so, but they were not, that was a, his brother, who looks exactly like him. So there's a festival going on, in the small village, and... There is a murder that takes place there. And so Amory Ames goes and investigates the murder. And then there's another murder that takes place. So, and her husband, Milo, is telling her not to get involved. In fact, uh, Milo's brother is accused of the first murder. So I won't go on further with that and pull it for you, but it's a very good read. It's only like 220 pages. It's very short. A very short, uh, cozy mystery read. And I really enjoy it. So this time I, I'm reading The Twelve Caesars by Suetonius. This is uh, with Jack the Rambling Racketeer. And one of the things about these uh, read-alongs I get involved in is I ne never finish the book, so maybe, hopefully, I'll finish this one because I'm trying to get my interest in Roman history. And I'm dipping in and out of uh, Oskrig, Hitler's War of Extermination in the East by Stephen G. Fritz. And... Uh, and this, and this is very, very detailed. It's very interesting. I can bookmark a couple uh, picks here. Let me see if I can find what I uh, written. If the German Reich comes into a foreign political conflict for foreseeable future, Gehring threatened, it can be taken for granted that we in Germany will think. Uh, bringing a great showdown with the Jews. 
This is earlier in the picture. The result would be uh, we would therefore, in the event of the war, be faced with the hard necessity of eradicating the Jewish underworld. The results would be the actual and final end of Jewry in Germany. It's a complete annihilation. This is under the chapter called Dilemma. Uh, this is in the first chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the author goes on and talks about a little bit more about the Jewish problem and comes up to with the uh, oh here's one right here one now that had been uh, Hitler's comment here in the news of the British declaration of war 3rd of September you see uh, Hitler wanted to have England join him in the fight against Bolshevism that's what he wanted. The German Soviet non aggression pact of 23rd of August, that pact with Satan in order to drive the devil out, had failed in its central purpose of preventing an Anglo French intervention. But it provided Hitler the protection resources needed to make a quick work of Poland. After a disciplinary peace offering to Britain and France on the 6th of October, which he likely never expected to succeed, Hitler answered his own question with the assistance of an attack in the West as soon as possible, since Germany could proceed in the East only when its borders in the West had been secured. Time, Hitler asserted in late September, would be in great general work against us when we do not use it effectively. The economic means on the other side are stronger. Time does not work for us in the military sense either. And making this judgment, Hitler looked to the East as well as the West, for he found, now found himself in a comfortable position of economic and strategic dependence on one state whose destruction was key to his ideology, Russia. He remarked to his tip, top commanders a few weeks later will remain dangerous in the future. Uh, shocking reports of Soviet actions in Poland confirmed Hitler's belief in the destructiveness of Jewish Bolshevism. The manifest deficiencies of the Red Army in the autumn of 1939 seemed to make apparent the catastrophic condition of this giant colossus. Germany, therefore, had a brief window of opportunity that had to be exploited. What Hitler had in mind in October 1939, however, in no way resembled what eventually resulted, a rapid and brilliant blitzkrieg rout of his western enemies. Instead, he envisioned simply a limited operation to push the western armies out of the low countries and northeastern France, seize the channel ports, and made Germany less of that vulnerable to the Allied counterattack. This would then allow him to turn his attention back to the east, which is basically where he wanted to do in the first place. In chapter two, called Decision, the the author relies a little bit on a gentleman by the name of Fritz. Holder, I think his last name is. Just a minute. See if I can find a quote from him. He was a ger he was the gentleman in the German camp that uh, Wilhelm Shire used his this gentleman's diary when Wilhelm Shire wrote the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Holder was his name, H-A-L-D-E-R, Franz Holder. Uh, ironically, on the same day, uh, excuse me, let me back up. Uh, once again, it was Holder who seemed to have his eyes turned to the east, given the reduction row of the warming in the west. On the 25th of June, Holder 
ordered his staff to study the reconstruction of the army with the goal of creating highly mobile special defense groups to counter any possible Soviet moves in the Balkans a threats to the important Romanian oil fields. As the odds turned to a preventive strike, those mobile forces became spearheads for a German offensive operation. Ironically, on the same day, Halder ordered a study. Hitler had marked optimistically, um, excuse me, the war in the East-West has ended, and I shall come in a short possible time to an understanding with England. There still remains a conflict with the East. That, however, is a task which throws up worldwide problems. One might perhaps tackle it in ten years' time. Now we have our hands full digesting and consolidating what we have obtained in Europe. And uh, so you, what you have is, is that Hitler's trying to, still trying to make a peace with uh, England. And England and Churchill is saying no. And at the same time, England is bombing uh, Germany during this time. Fritz Halder says, and I can't find the quote here, that he states that Fritz Halder says at one time that um, in his diary that He wanted to, uh, he, someone needed to take Hitler out. There should be a coup to take him out. And Holder says that he always carried a gun with him all the time he met with Hitler. But the reason he didn't shoot him was, Fritz Holder said that he was a good soldier. Um, a couple of other things here I'm going to point out. Oh, yeah, here it is. <clears throat> Economic pressures also contributed to Hitler's sense of urgency. In addition to reinforcing his notion, the absolute necessity of securing living space in Eastern Europe. The situation in the summer of 1940, in fact, resembled that of 1914 and 1918, when Germany was defeated because of deficiencies in raw materials and foodstuffs. Starvation, as yet, was not a problem, but by the fall of 1940, grain stockpiles would be exhausted. Although Germany had deprived, derived short-term economic advances from the alliance with the Soviet Union, the occupation of Western Europe and the threat of drawn-out war meant that Russia's willingness to, to supply foods and raw materials was crucial. Increasingly, too, the Germans expected that Moscow would exact a high price for such deliveries, certainly highly valued industrial and military goods, perhaps even hegemony in eastern and south, southeastern Europe. For his part, St Stalin, with his notion that a protracted war of attrition between the capitalist powers would benefit the Soviet Union had always intended to derive the greater advantage from the economic relationship with Germany, both to promote Soviet expansion aims and force Germany to provide vital goods and technology. The Germans got a first glimpse of Stalin's willingness to use his next leverage six weeks before the start of the offense in the West, when the Soviet Union typically suspended vital oil and grain deliveries. Although the situation had been quickly resolved, Germany now found itself in a far greater measure of economic dependence on the Soviet Union than anticipated, a dependence that was likely to increase the longer the war went on. Germany's reliance on Soviet group range supplies only rekindled ancient memories of the home hunger blockade of 1914 and 1918 proved especially stressful. So it's interesting how the uh, the author uses uh, the the food 
economics, and um, oil as a push by Hitler to uh, attack in, in the East, attack the Soviet Union, in order to keep the war going. Um, there was a um, someone on uh, uh, YouTube, excuse me, someone on YouTube posted a, a video of the Nuremberg war, uh, war crime trials after World War II. And a general policy uh, was a very key witness at these Nuremberg trials. He was the head of the Sixth, uh, German Sixth Army in the Battle of Stalingrad, where he lost, surrendered, and uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, put him all into a camp. Not a concentration camp, but actually a a prisoner of war camp, which used to be a, a uh, Russian Orthodox monastery. And they could wear their uniforms, they had three meals a day, they got attentive care by doctors, and they had everything available for them. So after the war, he comes and he testifies against the, uh, the Germans. And uh, Gehring and Rudolf Hess, and there's another gentleman there, I can't think of one of the high officials of, of Nazi Germany, that were there in the courtroom. And they were shocked to see Paulus walk into the courtroom. Well, that's it. And this is a, a very, very detailed, very interesting book. It's one of the books that if you're interested in, in the war in the East uh, against the Soviet Union, you should, you should purchase another book, and this will be real short. That you should purchase is uh, if I have it here. Oh yeah, here it is. It's a. Uh, when Titans Clash by David Glantz and Jonathan House. David Glantz is a incredible author of uh, the war in Eastern Europe uh, with Germany against the Soviet Union. He is incredible. So if you're interested in uh, the war in uh, the East during World War II, pick up anything by David Glantz. Or you can pick up this one, Oskreg, Oskreg, excuse me, the O is pronounced as X O. Oskreg by Stephen Fritz. Well, thank you very much for watching. Sorry it went too long, and have a good day.